In previous episodes, I've covered the theory of value at risk and also looked at examples of calculating the standard deviation of returns in Excel. But now it's time to make this real by coding value at risk and turning it into something that can be used as part of our algo trading. Stay tuned. DarwinX is a UK FCA regulated broker and asset manager on a mission to disrupt the financial trading, investing and asset management industries. If you're a talented trader looking to attract investor capital to your strategies, DarwinX is the fastest way for you to do this. We enable traders to raise third party investor capital and then charge success fees on high watermark profits. Additionally, DarwinX itself invests in its traders with our seed capital allocation program that allocates up to 90 million euros per year in successful trading strategies. So if all of that sounds interesting, learn more by clicking on the link here or you can find further links in the description right below. Now back to today's tutorial. This and the next two episodes will take you step by step through the process of coding value at risk. This will rely on the theory I've already taken you through in previous episodes. And if you've already watched those, you'll have no problem understanding the approach that I take. If, however, you haven't seen those episodes, then remember I always put a link in the description below that will take you to the YouTube playlist for the whole series. And from there, you can watch each and every episode and catch up with everything I've covered up until this point. But let's make a start. So as I've said on previous occasions, we're going to start off simple and we're going to look at value at risk for a single position. Following this, in future episodes, we will get more sophisticated and we'll start to code up value at risk for two assets, then any number of assets and positions. And we'll take that on even further to look at the efficient frontier. But for now, let's stick with a single position. And if you've seen those previous episodes, then you'll know that this is the formula that we're going to work with. And in this specific episode, I'm going to focus on calculating the standard deviation in MQL5. Now, whenever you are putting together code for a module or a component that you think will be reusable across multiple EAs and multiple scripts, then the best place to do that is in what's called an include file, which has the extension MQH, as you can see here. I've created an include file called Portfolio Risk Man, which is just short for Portfolio Risk Management. And then for any EA or script that you want to be able to take advantage of the code within this, you simply need to include this file at the top of your code as shown here. So in this case, this is a script, but you would follow precisely the same process if this was an expert advisor. But let's return to the risk management module for now. And in order to increase usability even more, I've decided to use an object oriented approach here and create this as a class called C Portfolio Risk Man. And this will have all of the properties and methods required to give us the functionality that we require. Now, the list of properties and methods will increase as we go through this process. And it's these public properties and methods here at the top that will be accessible from outside of this class, i.e. from our script and expert advisor. And at the moment, we just have two methods. The first is what's called a constructor, which is a method that is run when the class is instantiated in the first instance. And then the second is a method that will perform the majority of the calculations we're going to look at, and I've called that calculate VAR. So if we take a quick look at this constructor first of all, all this does is take in two parameters from the calling script or EA. One is the value at risk time frame, and the second is the number of periods to use for the standard deviation calculation. And the constructor simply sets the two properties that you see declared here and here 
with those values so that these values can then be reusable throughout the class. And as the number of methods increases, this is just a much more convenient way of accessing that data in order to perform the relevant calculations. So moving on now to the start of the calculate VAR method, which we see here, this also accepts two parameters at the moment. The first is the name of the asset. So for example, Euro JPY. And the second accepts the position size of that in lots, this parameter here. And so this, of course, is the asset or the position that we're going to be calculating the value at risk for. Now, just note this comment here. Normally, lot sizes are always positive, regardless of whether the position is long or short. And it's a second piece of metadata for the direction that determines whether it's a long or a short position. However, for the purposes of calculating value at risk, it makes it simpler if we instead use a positive position size if it's a long trade and a negative position size if it's a short trade. But at the moment, while we're just looking at a single position, it doesn't really matter. Your value at risk will always be a positive value. But later on, when we start to look at multiple positions, it then becomes critically important because we have to know whether we need to reverse the correlation between those assets or not, depending on whether they're both in the same direction or in the opposite direction to each other. So although it doesn't matter now, let's start off from this basis and it will just make things simpler as we move forward. Okay, so in this function, you can see there are a couple of to-dos. Um, this one is something we're going to look at in the next episode, and then this one will be in the episode after that. So for now, we're going to concentrate just on calculating the standard deviation of returns for the position. So effectively replicating what we did in the spreadsheet example previously. And if you remember, what we did was we took the close data from subsequent days and we used this formula to calculate what the return was, be it positive or negative, for that one day period. So these effectively make up your return values. And then we used a standard Excel function to calculate the standard deviation, both of very long term values and then looked much shorter term, just using the standard deviation across 21 trading days, so effectively a month. So let's return to our code now and see how we will do this. So in our calculate var method here, you can see I'm simply declaring a double variable called standard deviation of returns. I then call this function, which is get asset standard deviation of returns, and pass that two parameters. The first is the name of the asset, and the second is this variable here that I'm passing in by reference, which means that if the calling method sets this value, that value will now be available within this calculate var method. And if that function returns false, this if statement catches that, indicating that there was a problem of some sort, then I just alert the user and return false from this function because we're unable to now calculate the value at risk. But assuming everything's gone well and the standard deviation of returns variable has been correctly set, at the moment I'm just posting the result of that out to the user interface and then returning false at the moment so that no further action is taken because of course we haven't actually completed the final two stages of this yet. So let's take a closer look at the get asset standard deviation of returns method, which of course is where all the hard work's taking place. So we accept the name of the asset into this string variable here, and the ampersand that you see here just indicates that this is being passed in by reference, and so we need to set this value before we return from the method. Then I'm declaring a double array called returns. And to form an analogy with the work we did in Excel, this will effectively store these values that you see here. So I then just size that array to the number of periods used for the standard deviation calculation. And if you remember, this is one of the properties that we set up here in the constructor. 
So effectively, it gets set up with the number of periods that's passed in from the calling function in the script or the EA. So with that array properly sized, we can now start to populate it. So next we run through a calculation loop, this number of times determined by standard deviation periods. And this formula here will be familiar to you because it's exactly the same formula that we used here. It's the current price divided by the previous closed price minus one. And so here, we're doing this first for when the calculation loop will be equal to zero, and we're adding one onto that. And if you remember, this is exactly the same rationale that I covered in Excel. I don't like to use the current bar because the current bar is not yet complete. And so that could skew our results. So if we're performing this calculation just after a new bar has been created, the differential between the current close and the previous will be really small, and so this will have the effect of reducing the standard deviation measure. Whereas if we run this towards the end of a bar, then it will be normal in size, and so there's a discrepancy there. So I always calculate based on complete bars, which is why I add one onto this particular loop. So we then divide that by the close price of the previous bar, which we get with calculation loop plus two. And then we simply subtract one from that to give us the return as a ratio. And so on each loop here, we are using calculation loop here to determine which cell of the array is going to be populated. And with that done, we're then in a position to actually calculate the standard deviation. And that's precisely what this line of code does here where we're calling the math standard deviation function. And again, drawing an analogy with Excel, that's pretty much gonna give us exactly the same result as using this Excel function here. Now, this is a standard MQL5 provided function, but it's not available unless you actually include this include file here. So there's a number of specialist functions within this math folder. This is one to do with statistics, clearly being the standard deviation, and the actual library is called math.mqh. And if you include that at the top of your code, you then have access to all of the functions that form part of this. And one of those is this math standard deviation. Now this expects an array to be passed to it, on which it's going to perform its calculation. And of course, we've already just populated that here in the loop. So we simply pass that, and the value that gets returned from the function is the standard deviation of those returns. So because this was passed in by reference here, we've now set it, and so we can return true to say that we've successfully completed the calculation. And then if we return to our previous method here, at the moment, all we're doing with that is outputting that to the screen so that we can see the value of it. Of course, in the next episodes, we'll start to use that as part of the value at risk calculation. So the intention here is that the majority of the code and complexity around this will all be encapsulated within this include file. And what this means is that the code, when you now call this from a script or an expert advisor, will actually be very simple. So here we have a script and we've obviously included this, so we have access to that class. And so in the start function of the script, I'm declaring a new class instance called portfolio risk based on that class I've just created within this include file. And if you remember when we instantiate this, we have to pass it two parameters. One is the time frame that we want value at risk to be calculated based on. And the second is the number of periods we want to use for the standard deviation calculation. And both of these are actually input parameters for the script itself so that we can set those as we please when we run the script. And then here we have an if condition. And if that, function returns true, 
then we're going to print out what the value at risk is. Obviously, at the moment, we're returning false from this. And so other than putting a message box out for the standard deviation, that will then be the end of the script. So I'll just compile this to make sure that everything is in order. And so we've got zero errors and zero warnings. So now under our scripts folder here, we can see the DWEX value at risk script. And if we run that, we have a chance to alter the periods that we're going to calculate var based on. I'm going to keep that at one day and use 21 periods, which is the same as we used in Excel. What we're then going to do is choose which asset we want to have this theoretical position in. The lot size of that, which I'm going to set at 0.1, and we can run our script. So we can see that the standard deviation of returns at this moment for the last 21 days is 0.0056. And remember that that is a ratio. So if you wanted to convert that to a percentage, you'd simply multiply it by 100. And so in percentage terms, this is 0.5%. And so what this means is that if the assumption of the returns being normally distributed around a mean of zero, then approximately 68% of the returns would be between negative 0.56% and positive 0.56%. And so it gives us that idea of what the volatility is of this particular asset at the moment. Now, in comparison, if I run this again, but choose what I know to be one of the most volatile assets at the moment being natural gas. If we have a look at the result we get for this, this should be considerably higher. So we can see here it's approximately 10 times larger than the currency pair we looked at a moment ago. So here it would be 4.8%. So extreme volatility there given the current situation with natural gas prices. Okay, so just as a quick reminder, in the next episode, we're going to be looking at obtaining the nominal value, i.e. converting a lot size into a monetary value. And then in the episode that follows that, we'll bring it all together with the final value at risk calculation. And I'll talk a little bit more about how you can use this from a calling script or EA. So remember, there's always a link in the description that will take you to the playlist so that you can see all of the episodes in order if you need to catch up on any of those or if you haven't seen them already. But now until next time, trade safe.